Welcome to Find Out Friday. This is number 11, chapter 11, which means that myself and the lovely Sean have one more to go after this one. Now, before we get to the big reveal and the season finale and the next chapters of our lives, which, you know, will be massive. I wouldn't want to miss that one. We are about to reveal number 11, our special collaborator, the location in the world he comes from, the beach in question that was used for this and the artwork and what inspired it. Sean and I usually do a little brief catch up our lives have been crazy we were meant to have this out last week that was no longer possible we've had mad adventures sean how have you been uh, all good rebecca thanks yeah uh, as you say uh, the release number 11 um we promised ourselves that we'd get to uh, to 12 uh, collaborations uh so by the end of the project there'll be 24 videos 12 of the interviews and 12 of the released films. So it's 24 uh, films uh, in the project and perhaps there might be a little bit of a bit of a mashup or a, some kind of a little bit of work after that as well. So yeah, we, we're gonna hit the target. Uh, we know who the last track is as well, by the way. We know who this track is as well. Uh, and the uh, the last track, uh, we won't reveal who, but uh, I think it'd be fair to say that they're uh, one of our favorites that are revisiting us, that have already been on the project uh, for the grand finale, yes. which is gonna be a bit of a mashup of visuals and a great track to finish with. But this one, number 11, uh, yeah, this is um, this has been in the bag uh, a month or two, really, I suppose, back and forth with the artist. Um, I actually completed it about two weeks ago, so it was really refreshing to have the, uh, the world premiere uh, just between the three of us uh, just a few moments ago. Um, uh, where we got to see it on our screens just on the uh, on the side before us seeing it. But you'll have to wait until tomorrow um, because it's uh, Find Out Friday today. We'll find out who the artist is. We'll, we'll reveal who the artist is, but tomorrow then we'll release the final video. So I've been good. I've been good, Rebecca, and yourself. You've been on many adventures around the country. I, just the one, but it was a life-changing one. So, you know, uh, every so often the universe throws you a bone and uh, you find yourself in a funny location and you realize that everything changed when you got back you know i even have nails now like who even am i uh yes uh, and funnily enough the beach you used is actually very close to the location that i was at working on an incredibly um yeah life-changing commission yeah i uh so we, we featured one of the artists on 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 this um so my good friend joe cardamon um an incredible, credible inspiration to me, just a creative force above all else. And the incredible Mark Lanigan uh, are collaborating on a project. And as Mark is currently based in Ireland, Joe and his brother, Sean, it's funny, a Joe and a Sean collaborating as artists. I love that for us. Um, they, they came to Kerry and they asked me to come and help them do the behind the scenes uh, footage for upcoming music videos. So I was kind of there art hand uh, on the Irish <laughs> on the Irish scene helping behind the scenes um, I have to say it was an incredible experience they are some of the most down to earth uh, rock legends I've ever met I mean I've met people who thought they were rock stars before but actual rock stars are pretty humble and kind and encompassing and I wish them every luck with this new project which is obviously Dark Mark versus Skeleton Joe um, the videos will be coming soon, so I can't wait for everyone to see the mashup they were able to create. And yeah, just an incredible experience. And then I, you know, came back to Waterford, got my nails done. <laughs> new haircut. We got new hair. <laughs> Who I, even I am I? I see the addition of a bass guitar behind you there. Yeah, so I've had that bass since I'm 16 years old. Uh, I used to be in a punk band. Uh, her name is Chatel. She's called after a Swiss village that I went to boarding school in, Chatel Saint-Denis. And I haven't picked her up in years. Uh, funnily enough, the first time I picked her up in about 12 years was at Scarfest when the bass player for Simrip uh, gave me bass lessons in the green room. <laughs> So now I, I started playing her again a little bit. Um, I say that I, I mess around with her a good bit, but like, yeah, I don't think I play bass. That's not entirely true. Uh, but yeah, my punk band back in the day was called Spilt Milk, so no use crying over that now either, you know. And you yourself have launched a new podcast. Now, what I love about this, Sean, 
is I was only thinking about this earlier. There are certain things in the world that we can still allow ourselves as pleasures and an immersive sound experience, which is also something that you do as an activity, a night, uh, an event. And now you've actually transported those sounds, those incredibly healing sounds of the Copper Coast and gone and made a beautiful podcast. You're on episode two within, I don't know, three days because you're a force of nature. Um, talk to us about that very briefly before we bring on our guest. Yeah, well, uh, actually, uh, actually, I released the third uh, release today, actually, which, no. was, uh, which was me, uh, uh, which was me feeding the horses. Uh, it was just like, basically, I bought a microphone a few months ago and I've been looking at it in the studio here. There it is, the little thing. There she is. Look, little microphone and a new pair of uh, headphones. And, okay. Uh, so, okay. so I've been looking at them for a few months and I've decided, you know, what what difference is there between electronic music at one end and, and then kind of like the sounds of nature on the other end? Maybe the, maybe you might think there's a big gap, but for me, I suppose as an artist, I'm just kind of ex always exploring new territory um, in terms of mixing up different art forms. Um, you know, I suppose I used to call myself a visual artist, but I suppose more these days I call myself an environmental artist, which is kind of a broader term. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I'm recording sounds that I encounter uh, I bring it with me when I go for a walk on the beach or... One the second. The this children on the street have just summoned me. <laughs> Guys, I'm working. I'm at my computer. I'll see you later. Apologies. Um, I have uh, friends that are in the very early stages of their lives and ordinarily I tell them not to knock but I didn't see them on the street earlier. Um, we, we hang out quite a bit. But uh, yes... You are an environmental artist, and you are trying something different. I think so, but I, I, but I think I think that people. It's find out Friday. I actually think that uh, less enough about me, enough about you. I think we should introduce our new guest. Yes, we should. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are very honoured to introduce our next collaborator, number. 11 drum roll please welcome to supersonic sand drone in the woods keith how are you today i'm doing well yeah been um busy rehearsing with uh with my band this morning into the afternoon nice uh, that's been good fun amazing yeah. So obviously we can see your beautiful instruments in the background there's a small proportion of them yeah there's more um all the guitars are in the wardrobe next to me here um, and then there's synths in, uh, in cases and stuff scattered around yeah yeah <laughs> uh, a lot of it needs to be moved on so i can buy some newer newer easier lighter more uh, modern gear i think but i've got a lot, a lot of old vintage stuff which is which sort of it's a uh, it's a good time now to get rid of it i think yeah, like they, there's two schools of thought on that one. It's like the old ones kind of seem to be more durable, maybe, and interesting no. sounding, but they are clunkier. The guitars, yes, but not the synths. The okay. Synths, kind of, yeah, yeah. They can get expensive to look after. Um, yeah. I, think yeah. I can sell like one of my old ones and buy like, you know, two or three new ones. Wow. Yeah, at some point. But yeah, so a bit of a bear studio, but I mean, I don't really do that much in here at the moment. Uh, I'll be doing more in here over uh, over the winter, but normally I'm out outside uh, in the woods, in the hedgerow, on the hill, on the beach, um, which is where I normally write my music and do it all at the moment these days. It's kind of uh, pandemic inspired. Um, before pre-pandemic, I was probably playing in about five different bands on and off here and there and then um suddenly we weren't allowed to meet up so i just started focusing on my own music which i've been doing all along i guess for the last 30 plus years or something uh but then yeah so then we were allowed to meet up outside with one other person so i started making music in the hedgerows locally with friends and then um and i just kind of ended up staying there really um yeah that's so it's all been quite quite pandemic inspired in the first place um and then through that as well i got quite active on um on a couple of facebook groups um where loads of artists just got together in the middle of the pandemic and started uh, creating um compositions together and producing albums and stuff that's been 
really good. That's been really uh, motivating. Um, um, yeah, so just trying to think. So I kind of like just try and stick out some videos every couple of weeks at the moment on my YouTube channel, which is uh, kind of, as I've created it about a year and a half ago, and some of the videos are starting to take off. It's all going on. Yeah, inexplicably as well. Um, I don't know how if you get the same experience of YouTube, but suddenly like you get loads of views from absolutely nowhere on a video that you'd forgotten about sort of thing. It's all quite bizarre. Um, so doing that, um, I said I was rehearsing this morning. So, so I've, get, I've got an old band back together. Well, it was a duo, um, call, it, call it a band, but it's the two of us. Um, and just before the pandemic, the other guy, the singer, went off to um, China to teach and earn a bit of money. Um, uh, and that was just before the pandemic, and it was actually uh, right next to Wuhan, and so got stuck for a couple of years. <laughs> um, but then, so he's back now, and uh, he went off with like some banjos and guitars and stuff because we were kind of folky electronic, folktronica. And then he came back with loads of synths instead, uh, which is just great. So we're just doing, we, we ditched the guitars, ditched all the strings, and we're just doing lots of synth stuff. And that's quite good. So that all my drone in the woods feeds into that quite nicely, which makes it quite easy to do. I sort of, there's a couple of compositions that have been used for both. Um, thing. Um, and then I guess the only other musical thing that I've kept going through this time is I've got like a, a space punk band that I front. Yeah, which is quite fun, quite funky. The Radio Controlled Lobsters. Um, what a name! With like space pops, uh, space punk. I mean, there's nothing popular about it at all. Space punk stuff about songs that I write in the kitchen when I'm washing up, stuff like that. Um, uh, combined in Tupperware with Area 51. Songs about um, how much I hate TV and the news and stuff. Um, yeah. That sort of things. Netflix got a good song about Netflix. Um, yeah, <laughs> not the most accomplished lyricist. But um, people seem to enjoy what I do. It's quite funny. Uh, shout and jump around a lot. Um, and play electric guitar in that one. Wow. Yeah. I think I would be really into that band. So after this interview is finished, you will send me a link okay. to where uh, I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's all sort of like just, yeah. I've got one, one properly recorded song that I did um, a few months ago in a studio at college. Uh, uh, other than that, yeah. But I'll, I'll find something and send you something to give you a good idea. Me. That's kind of uh, that I have a, a secret YouTube channel for that, which is only for the people that uh, <laughs> have jammed with me or, or whatever. I, I won't share it around. I have, to, I have to give you a link to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, me and my five year old son, Keanu, we jam mm -hmm. a lot and we write similar songs. It's actually a tradition I started yeah, with my yeah. mother when I was small and I couldn't see her in the house. So she would sing at me what her day was. And I would sing back what my day was so that mm -hmm. we'd still be in touch. Like, let's say she was having a shower, you know, in a different room, yeah, just in a different right. room. So me and Keanu, that we, we sing our emotions to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that's why my lyrics aren't that developed. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, that's all been cool. Um, it's been quite, it was quite a challenge, the, uh, bringing it back to uh, supersonic sand. Um, the, the, the biggest surprise, I, I, when I was put in touch with Sean uh, by a mutual friend, um, and so then... Um, big shout out, big shout out, Mark. Yeah. So Mark the, Anthony Hayden Ford, who I call Gandalf and you call... Fraud, yeah. Fraud. Um, <laughs> uh, he's been like, uh, he's been making art with me while I've been doing music for a long, long time, I guess since the late 90s, maybe a bit earlier. Um, I had like a dance rock band yeah, ages ago, a dance, sort of electronic stuff. Um, and we we're a bit of a collective and he used to do all the paint, all the backdrops and stuff like that. Uh, he did some live art while we were performing as well, that sort of thing. So I've always had quite a bit of a, an influence of art stuff in my music. I performed for uh, dance performances and stuff in the, in the old days when I was just working out how to make my own sort of sounds, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so he got me in touch. Uh, he he put me in touch with you, and then um, the the the, first, the biggest shock of all was when uh, Rebecca told me that my track had to be uh, less than three minutes. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I have ri ever written a track less than three minutes. It was just... actually no, I have actually. I'll tell a lie. I I did two um, on that Facebook group I was talking about earlier. 
with the compilations, I did two tracks which were only one minute long. But one minute is a lot easier to do than three minutes. And three minutes is really, really hard. Because most of my tracks are kind of 15 minutes plus, I suppose. Oh, I'd never intend them to be that. I mean, it's just, it was the same with the rehearsal I had this morning with the band. Uh, we thought we were going to do sort of, you know, try and play through as much stuff as we could in the time. We ended up doing three jams that were 40 minutes long each. So uh, <laughs> it always seems to end up that way. But, uh, there we go. I like to explore and go on a journey with the music. Yeah, so um, sorry for that new challenging challenge. No, um, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> you know. As um, I... So I just kind of like thought, yeah, so I just uh, I took something I was working on, um, which I'd been writing in the woods, and just condensed it, squashed it down, shoved it on the laptop, sped it up a bit. Uh, and then obviously because the sound, the, the sand and the sea, I had a, a sample that I'd taken a month before. Um, Sean was talking earlier about how he, um, you know, um, think about mixing audio samples and electronic music and everything because um, I, I do the same. Um, and I had, and I just often just record stuff. I find often my phone can be just as good as my field recorder for getting audio on. Sometimes it, it's better even. Um, and I just recorded down the, the sea when I was having a walk with um with a couple of people from my family um and i listened back to it and i thought oh there's too much too much um ambient voices going on people around and stuff i'll never get to use it because you know normally my stuff is much more nature driven uh and then i listened to it again in context whilst this tune was playing along and heard um it's actually my mum's partner him laughing which i think is quite prominent at the beginning of the track and it just did really well it just sort of reminded me of like sort of childhoods down at the beach and you know people having having fun so i thought that should go on there and it felt like quite a fun track to me as well i was originally calling it a um, squirrel song because i've been uh, twice i'd worked on it in the woods um i've got the videos up on my youtube channel um and i both of them were finished with members of the public walking up to me and talking about squirrels uh, which is how that happened uh, and they do while I'm setting up, they're all running around above my head, um, just and so there's constantly bits of twig and stuff falling on me and the equipment. Uh, and then they normally kind of hang back once I actually start making music. But yeah, I try to encourage the birds to join in. That's really good. Um, but then that can be tricky as well, because sometimes you get different sort of bird calls that aren't so relaxing. So when I was trying to do that squirrel song, actually, I um, had to abort a couple of times because there was um, some buzzards screaming over top. So I guess I must have been under one of their nests or something and it was nesting season. So they weren't happy at all. So um, yeah, that kind of spoiled it when you're trying to do a nice ambient kind of track and you've got a bird screaming at you, <laughs> not very far above your head. But yeah, I tried to get as many as good like field recordings as I can mixed in with the stuff. I mean, I've been doing a lot of video stuff recently, but all my um, releases that I've done, which have mainly been on Bandcamp, um, I've got a lot of field recordings in, in them all. You know, lots of bird song. I find it really relaxing. Uh, where I used to live, um, we've moved now, but where we used to live, we were, um, uh, I was on, uh, in a first floor flat and um, it was in a little close and uh all the eaves are just full of sparrows and so you just i couldn't remove them from all the recordings anyway because all you can ever hear all times a year is just sparrows and when you got to the summer and you had all the windows open then it was quadraphonic so you'd just be in, in the lounge which is where i had the studio at the time and the sound of sparrows was coming in from all four windows all four directions uh so and then when i had like rehearsals with, with other musicians and stuff and we recorded through microphones then there they were there's nothing we could do about it. And so I just started trying to stop fighting the birds and just sort of um, introduce them into my tracks. Uh, my cat loves it. He just goes crazy every time. Well, he kind of, I say that, he, he sort of ignores them now. He, he realises now that it's me making music and working on tracks, but yeah, he still catches them out sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it's lovely to, lovely, lovely to hear the genesis of the um, of your field recording, making it into the track and the final video that will release tomorrow. Like, uh, like I mean, so that's your mother's partner uh, yeah, giving that yeah. laugh. It's, it's lovely. To yeah, he's got he's got a very loud, distinctive laugh. So it's absolutely yeah. perfect. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. 
So like, I suppose what I did with the track then is um, like, um, is like I, I sat with it for a while, and uh, I mean I loved it. But as soon as we heard it, it was it was it was we, we both Rebecca and I we both loved it, and we said, yeah, this is going to have to be one of the, one of the one of the dozen. Um, so then I was down in Kerry uh, a month ago on a on a project for a, a festival, an annual the annual uh, sand art festival in Ballybunion, in the in the Kingdom of Kerry. Uh, with uh, Joe and I went down uh, to, to uh, there's a few different crews from around the country come down um, to uh, our friend Pixie down there in Gronia. Uh, so um, so like to, uh, when I arrived on the beach that morning, I didn't actually know that it was going to end up with a collaboration uh, with Drone in the Woods. Um, um, uh, so but but the location, I think when, when I got back and I looked at the footage and compared the music again, it was like a, I kind of thought um it, 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 it had to sit together now i haven't tried to as i was with some of the earlier releases where i was trying to really get into the exact pace and rhythm of the song now i'm kind of um after doing after this is the 11th kind of music video in the series i kind of like <clears throat> allow both to stand uh independent um so so even in this the opening scene is like a bubbles mm -hmm. um and I had just gone for a swim because the tide was in, so I had to swim around the headland to get onto the beach. But we had to climb down a cliff, Joe and I, uh, and the tide was still locking us in. So I swam around the headland, getting on the main beach, main part of the beach. And then, uh, like, there's all these bubbles in the water. So again, like, like the organic nature of creating in a woods, like what you're doing, Keith, like is, uh, for me, I didn't have any idea what I was going to make that day. But it was just all these bubbles as you're swimming in the water and they were there in front of me. So... Uh, so it had to be bubbled. So I just went large with the bubbles and I kind of the opening uh, moments of your track uh, with the beach ambience and the uh, your mother's partner's uh, laugh. Uh, for me, that just had this kind of bubbling kind of a nature that I, I felt it had to sit together. So. Uh, uh, so, yeah. And, and like the first, I think it's 54 seconds of the track is quite um, pensive and building up to this point where it really breaks, it jumps, takes a jump up. Uh, so, so it's literally just the bubbles for the first third of the song, um, uh, and then like Nuns Beach in Valley Bunyan is, in my opinion, like the best location in the world for sand art that I've ever seen. Um, it's like like aesthetically the quality of the sand, um, like the vantage points, the cliffs, the rocks, um, like it's it's difficult to get to. Uh, not many people get climb down onto it. It's got the virgin rock. It's got like a so it's really, really a special place. So as well, your song as it builds, your track as it builds has this kind of uh, kind of like this epic kind of uh, large scale feel to it, this open air kind of large scale. Um, uh, so again, the, some of the footage from this is very large and uh, large scale and the artwork is large and the clips are large. So it's got that kind of a triumphant uh, kind of feel to it. So I th that I thought kind of sat together. So. Uh, so uh, looking forward to seeing what people think when we release it. Oh, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, I mean, when I saw the, the preview of the video there, I was uh, uh, presuming that you hadn't didn't get many people walking. I mean, it looks like a fantastic, such a lovely bit of beach, but uh, we need to find inaccessible places, obviously, to have a bit of time to create. Um, I, I sometimes rarely I'll get somebody sort of walk. Yeah, you know, occasionally you, you will get the odd member of the public will just walk up and stand right next to you and start talking to you, even though you're right in the middle of creating something, uh, and and won't go away until you stop everything. <laughs> and they and then they come out with the most, you know, like like oh, you don't see everyone any someone doing this any day, every day of the week. And we're like, yeah, you probably could have saved that point to yourself, and <laughs> maybe just observe from a distance. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. Um, it's, but it's one of those things. It's like when people come up to me on the beach, and uh, Joe, Joe, and I have a bit of a technique where we kind of like uh, Joe, Joe kind of cuts off. If if you kind of walk in a certain direction in the beach, you can actually change other people's direction. They, okay. Like okay. I can yeah, kind of yeah, peripherally yeah. see you can in the forest is what I'm. You can kind of say, oh, they're heading straight for me. They're heading straight for me. They're heading straight for me. I'm not really here to have a conversation. So like your body language and your posture and you like I'd often walk I'd often be drawing but actually walk off in a different direction if they really need to track me down they're gonna have to walk for miles yeah, sure, sure. so uh, so so but look you but what could you say I mean it's uh you know you could just well, I mean, smile I, again. I, I find sometimes I, I just have to basically 
go places I, I shouldn't be really um and I and I justify that by taking away any one any other rubbish that I find that's lying around so I always leave it cleaner than when I arrived and and I feel then I feel kind of justified jumping that barbed wire fence or whatever I've had to do you know if I walk out with a carry bag full of rusty old cans and bottles that have been lying there for 10 years then you know then that's something good so I, I suppose similar to me, I don't have to climb any barbed wire fences, but I've got a couple of hideouts in the uh, mm. on the Copper Coast here at the moment. One in particular, which is an amazing, uh, uh, underneath a hedgerow in uh, on a cliff, um, overlooking a spectacular piece of beach, and it's kind of like it's not my field, uh, so yeah. it's kind of like I don't really, I haven't shared it with anybody yet. Uh, my son Alfie is the only person on the planet that knows exactly where it is, um, um, but I will be bringing a group there for the solstice. So if the uh, landowner doesn't like the idea, I suppose it's after that when they'll find out. So yeah. forgiveness, yeah. Uh, yeah. what do they say? Is it forgiveness is easy? Then permission. I don't yeah, yeah. Rather than getting the permit. Yeah. So, uh, so, but yeah, like, I mean, sometimes like uh, the beauty of sitting in a ditch with a microphone or not, um, uh, do you know, in a simple little place that hasn't been touched underneath a hedgerow where nobody has been in maybe mm-hmm. ever uh, or, or maybe since that, it was just a stone wall or whatever it is is that kind of sense of like, like as a kid i used to love uh hiding in hedgerows uh pretending to be waiting for the bus to come for school but you know and it's great in a hedgerow because you can kind of like pretend that the bus never came if you stay in the hedgerow yeah okay okay yeah <laughs> Um, I have a technique I use in life in general. I wear really bright colors and act the way I act very loudly. I call that tree frogging and people stay away from me because, you know, nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another way of doing it. (laughs) I thought I could play kind of uh, aggressive, loud music in the woods and that would probably keep people away. You know, (laughs) while you use a very sharp knife to cut some wood. Or, or create uh, a series of man traps. Peel around, some spuds. You know, <laughs> Blair Witch Project, the hell out of that wood. <laughs> uh, so we're actually three really nice people. Anyone watching this is like, no, seriously, we don't do that. We really don't do that. We'd, we'd love to meet you someday. No, we, we are. Uh, we are very nice people. So um, what Sean was saying about like uh, putting the video to the music and how I used to try to sync it up and stuff, I, I found that uh, I'm sure the human brain just puts the syncing in there, you know, and you don't actually need to do it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I sort of sequenced the track itself to be kind of the rhythm of the sea at the front, but I didn't know, you know, I presume then that might match a rhythm for you, being that it's sort of you were next to the sea as well. But obviously it wasn't going to be, you know, precise in any way. Um, I remember like when I used to live with a band in a house, so we always used to have like the TV was always on, but the volume was never, ever up. So there's always music on, but the TV was on. And, and it seems like half the time the pictures matched the music that was on. That's right. That's and, right. and that's just your, your brain does that. So you don't need to yeah. worry about yeah. syncing stuff yeah. up physically that much. Yeah, yeah. Like there is, there is a couple of moments in the film where the, there's a flyover from through the grass, where there's a big reveal, the big epic reveal, and and for me, the, the, I did make sure that that moment coming out of the bubbles yeah. over over the uh, over the cliff to this reveal, I did make sure that there was this kind of sense of uh, it was well, it's not like down to the exact moment, but that the music is building to this kind of moment of reveal. And then it just kind of carries on on its kind of epic journey. Um, so yeah, so so as you say, like it's not. Um, I used to do that as well with the TV. Like you know, you, you have the music on, but like these visuals, and you could sit down, like you could sit down all night and yes. pick through the stations and find the most amazing thing that is like um, you know, no drugs needed. Like I mean, you you can just actually do it without drugs, people. Um, it does work, uh, uh, but you know, you can find the most amazing some old black and white film, and then there's some. Uh, some electronic beat going on in the back it just sits perfectly with it so uh so yeah so um so yeah so so uh i think that's so, just part of yeah the human need to, to see patterns everywhere isn't it i mean and if you look at your art and my music i mean it's the patterns are so uh such an important part such an important base i mean yeah. um, obviously the patterns that you create in the sand uh and then the patterns of the tide itself is a pattern over time 
and then for me with the, the music I thought I, I I don't I've never learned music theory so it's all just sort of a pattern that I try to memorize quite often find a note that doesn't work and then make sure I don't play that ever again um, kind of thing and obviously there's a, another beautiful cosmic fated thing between all of us here um you are a mathematician and you studied sand uh more precisely uh time thing timey turny things yeah 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 just uh i was uh did my dissertation on or i studied um pure and applied physics up in manchester in the 90s which was uh, uh, a pretty crazy time to be up there hacienda was still going um i kind of uh discovered electronic music in a big way uh the people i was living with we were putting up the djs that were um djing at the dry bar which was underneath the hacienda so there's quite a few big names sort of hanging out at ours on the weekend um sort of learned to dj and stuff through that that was quite quite cool um but then but obviously i was there to study physics um which uh i've always been kind of an applied mathematician i suppose in a way um and like for the dissertation, you you could you had a choice of like uh, there's about sixty of us on the course. There was probably you know, fifty nine um, projects you could do that someone else had done before, and then number sixty was the one that no one had done before, and that was the flow of sand through an hourglass. So, and I'd looked at some sand on my second year project, so I, I was able to bag that one. Um, and uh, so yeah, so that was looking at the sand. It was quite uh, interesting. There was. Um, there hadn't been done much research done at all. All I could find, I mean, I, re I, re I referenced myself for my second year <laughs> project. Uh, I referenced some guy from the 1800s that had been looking at sand dunes. And then there was like a, a, a article that had been published like a year prior that was really recent about. And um, so I kind of based my research around that and managed to disprove pretty much most of what that they'd published. So that was quite interesting um just about how the speed whether it's constant of the flow of the sand coming out all the time or i found that it changed over time quite significantly um yeah it was, it was quite a, it was quite a practical investigation actually i was um sort of uh, I, had, I was layering the sand in in different colors um letting it flow through and then stopping it and then sealing it all with gelatine and uh, and then sawing the, the things in half so that i could look at all the patterns inside and uh, construct graphs and stuff out of them anyway yeah it was stuff that I, I wouldn't be interested in doing now but at the time <laughs> um and I, and I didn't I never ended up publishing it which is kind of a shame because since there's been a big drive looking into physics of sand and that what with um uh our dreams of colonization of mars so there's been nasa's actually done quite a lot of research on sand and um who knows i could have been like credited if i'd actually uh, if i actually had been bothered to type up my dissertation and, and publish it as my supervisor uh strongly suggested i should have done but there we go <laughs> you always look back with regret um maybe oh, then yeah. maybe i would have got too involved in being a scientist and i wouldn't be making music in the hedgerows right now exactly and in every situation that we did not navigate correctly there is a massive lesson no, and what no. we take forward as a blessing and a lesson that's what life is about so you know yeah indeed, indeed. so i teach maths now i teach maths and physics um at the local college um so i'm still got that side of my brain going uh, yeah uh, <laughs> i've moved into engineering actually recently which is even more like applied maths so getting to apply everything uh, that I've sort of picked up over the years. Yeah. It's mad, um, isn't it? We kind of go around picking up all these skills and we never know what they're going to add up to until they add up to the thing they're going to add up to. I love that about life. <laughs> Indeed. I've been getting quite uh, nicely sidetracked at work uh, building battery powered and cycle powered um, uh, sound systems. Wow. Which has been quite, yeah, it's been quite good. So I've, um, I've been, I've played uh, at, on a small stage in Glastonbury a couple of times. Uh, my friends go there and set that up and that's all uh, bicycle powered uh, they play on like the smallest stage in the smallest field but it's actually the most kind of authentic part of Glastonbury going um, so I was there what, two years ago and I got to jam on stage with there were three uh, other musicians that were at the original first ever Glastonbury festival two who were musicians so um, Nick Turner from Hawkwind um, and uh, 
a friend of mine um and then another guy who was like a baby at the time whatever but still that was three three musicians from the original festival up there yeah all having a crazy kind of space psychedelic jam uh it's great it's a little bit of the festival that nobody knows about the, the you know no one goes there the security don't go there the police leave it alone um so people we can have our own fires and stuff um and uh, yeah it's great that's, that's really fun um so that's kind of inspired me with the whole uh, battery powered stuff i got into battery powered music and that obviously doing the hedgerow and then it's just sort of thought, well let's start doing this uh, so i've got a friend uh, for work we're looking at maybe trying to put some gigs on next year outdoors um with this. so he's just been trying out the sound system actually up at the protest in london uh, last weekend and the sound system went all very well i got to write a track actually i wrote a backing track for them to chant over at the uh, julian assange uh, protest um so that's pretty cool i wasn't able to make it as i was with, um, away on holiday but um yeah so they sent me a there's a little, tiny little clip of uh, my track being used I'm one of the small amount of um, uh, material that the press have released, but you know it's been here and there. It's good. The numbers are building on that. Um, so yeah, so the he so he took up our battery, our cycle power station, but um, sound system. But now we've uh, adapted it to run off batteries as well. Um, so that yeah, but that we run it off battery uh, cycle for like doing educational stuff with with kids and that, at, like in environmental fairs and stuff like that. Because uh, basically that adults aren't really interested if you're not already concerned about the environment then you're not going to have your mind changed at this point but you know the the, the kids we can do something good with and the kids kind of reel in reel yeah. in the mums and dads in terms of um like the, the primary level kids even are, are the greatest educators of adults yes, at the moment yes, i find indeed, because indeed. if you have a group of uh, primary school kids they go home and um you know you meet their parents a month later or two months Oh, my little Mary said that, you know, um, acorns don't grow on trees or because of uh, how the leaves fall is how, you know, or whatever the thing is, uh, like they're edu they listen to their uh, they listen to their kids. Uh, so it is maybe kind of like a lesson for us all in terms of sustainability uh, that it, sometimes it takes a, a young kid. Uh, Greta Thunberg uh, ring, makes uh, rings rings a bell in terms of like waking up a few things. Um, uh, in terms of what we what we've done to the planet, uh, so uh, so so like like what what kind of stuff would you bring to the woods? It's all it's all battery powered, then, Keith. What you yeah yeah, I kind of, I put my setup together. I kind of um, well, kind of at the beginning, of just before the pandemic, really, or maybe it was the beginning of it that I decided I need to go battery wise. Um, and so I bought a couple of new bits of kit that could take batteries. Um, I just sort of did a lot of research and into it. Uh, but now I, I didn't really need to do that because now, like uh, everyone's using lithium power packs and stuff, the prices come right down on them. They um, uh, and obviously that's so much better, like than me eating my way through lots of um, AA batteries and stuff all the time, and then having to dispose of them. So um, I'm kind of switching over to lithium at the moment, uh, and then hopefully I'm going to have like one battery that will run everything, everything off of it. But yeah. But then it also it, it adds um, adds a boundary to the time, you know. If I am running off of batteries, and I know I've got like, well, I mean, most of the time I run out to the woods, and I literally spend probably about an hour actually making music at the most, you know, because I mean we've all got busy lives, and it's kind of get to a spot, quickly try and make some music and get away, and then you know, I guess I was on about a one in three success rate, I guess, with my jams and videos and everything. I've got that up to probably about a two in three success rate which is which i'm pretty happy with um yeah so I've sort of that's amazing like i am part of a community garden here i am i'm the pr and um, pr and events manager in this community garden that we took over a landfill there 14 months ago and recently enough we had an outdoor gig but oh, yeah. we have no electricity there so i ended up having to steal electricity from the chickens in the following fields your idea would have been a lot better to run my gig like and yes chicken powered music is also an option yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's more than being done you know there's um uh, i've got friends who i'm on a big solo stage um i can't remember their name otherwise i'd give them a shout um and uh, i mean well orbital recorded an album probably 10 15 years ago maybe more all all on solar power um 
I'm actually because uh, I'm, I'm uh, in this new house I moved into, and we've got a, a brick shed which will become my studio. And my intention is for that to be completely solar powered. Um, so there'll be no. I mean, there is mains going to it, but oh, that's going to be for power tools for the garden. Um, and just yeah, I'm going to build another room inside and rig it all up with a solar panel on top. Uh, and then I should never ever have to supply any mains electricity at all. Wow. Everything's coming down in price. Solar panels are fall, falling in price now. So yeah. It's all becoming achievable. Yeah, this is good. This has been a mind-blowingly interesting chat. Now, yeah. they all are, right? <laughs> they all are. There is not one supersonic sand where you just don't go, hmm, these are my people. Uh, <laughs> but yes, I guess we should probably wrap it up, men. Uh, Keith, yeah. it has been an absolute pleasure to meet you face to face for the first time. And I guarantee you, I will be in touch because, Excellent. you know, I really want to hear that band. Sean, well done on everything you do forever. Tomorrow, 8 p.m. is when the Artscape goes live. Bubbles in paradise. Give these two creators the kudos they deserve because they are slaying life, being sustainable, making sure that everyone is aware of the importance of nature. And that's kind of it. And one more thing, one more thing. Keith, you, you've never been to Ireland. You are going to have to come and uh, visit us here uh, with your sustainable sound. Uh, bring bring our good friend Mark over with you, if you like, uh, or whatever. But you gonna have to bring some of some of what you're having over here because uh great work keep up the great work yeah, thanks a million for being part of the project yeah okay so. guys see you tomorrow 8 p.m yeah. thanks everyone for watching yeah.